Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Greetings. I am Reverend Nikki Ashwood, Program Executive for the Just Community of Women and Men here at the World Council of Churches, and I am your moderator for this day's proceedings. This Thursday in Black, we welcome you to the launch of Just For You, Taking Action Against Tech Facilitated Gender-Based Violence. Over the past two to three years, the World Council of Churches and the World Association for Christian Communicators have collaborated on a special project to raise awareness of and move toward overcoming tech facilitated GBV. Whereas this was once an unknown issue, TFGBV, as it is now called, has become increasingly prevalent with the rise in use of smart devices of humans by all ages. We, as a collaborative team, have hosted several webinars on this and with the assistance of the German Federal Foreign Office, we have trained 10 youth in December 2023. These youth represented the first cohort of trainees and more critically, they launched the Thursdays in Black Youth Edition from their own perspectives with initiatives for and by youth. To date, we have had trainings in Latin America and five regions in Africa with plans on the way for work in the other WCC and WAC regions. What the youth have done with this training is exceptionally commendable. Their responses confirm that there is scope for others, not only youth, to be involved in this campaign. And that's where you come in. As part of our joint initiative to build a global gender-focused observatory of social media, we offer you today our toolkit to counter TFGBV. Yes. With me today are colleagues from both WCC and WAC who will provide insights on TFGBV as well as other information critical to the use of the tools. You are welcome, of course, to offer your comments and questions in the chat. But first, a word from our youth the first training cohort. Racism, colonialism, and other structures of oppression amplify gender-based violence. Every 11 minutes, a woman or a girl is killed by her intimate partner or a family member. Intimate partner violence is a social disease. Over 55% of women in Asia have faced intimate partner violence at least once in their lives. Gender-based violence advocacy means standing in solidarity with men and women who are victims of gender-based violence and abuse. I pledge in making sure that young people are informed on the topic around gender-based violence. Stand with us in the Thursdays Days in Black initiative. Youth have a voice. You have the power to make a difference and to change the narratives of oppression that gender-based violence perpetuates. Join us as we will to let justice roll down like waters. With us today is Dr. Sarah Macharia, WAC Program Manager of Gender and Communication. She has been involved with this project from its inception and was one of the key trainings in the December 2023 training. Welcome, Sarah. Tell us, what exactly is tech-facilitated gender-based violence and what are its impacts? Thank you, Reverend Nikki. And we will, I have a PowerPoint uh, to share with you.
So Walter, thank you. So earlier this year, a landmark conference was convened to discuss civil society input towards the Pact of the Future, which is a framework for international cooperation to address the numerous crises of our times. At the conference, there was a section on digital inclusion, and it boggled my mind to learn that one, there is a lack of a shared political will to address tech-facilitated gender-based violence, uh, acronym or abbreviated as TFGBV, and that global consensus is missing on the gravity of TFGBV or that it even exists. There are numerous consequences for this impasse. For example, a failure to include it in policy agendas, in national data collection and investment priorities. And this impasse also means that the status quo continues relatively unchecked. So what is TFGBV? Next slide. So TFGBV is the most pervasive form of human rights violation on the internet. It is often asked, is it actually violence? While international human rights standards, such as the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which was adopted in 1979, have long recognized emotional and psychological abuse as forms of violence, including many forms of TFGBV, lawmakers and the general public continue to grapple with the question of whether certain harmful technology facilitated behaviors are actually forms of violence. For those who recognize these behaviors as harmful, the term TFGBV is preferred over any other because it is conceptually broader uh, than say online violence, cyber violence, digital harassment, representation of violence, and many other terminologies. And that is because TFGBV, the term, captures the whole range of technologies and even the new ones that are emerging. Next slide. Technologies are not value free. At the same time, users make choices on how they apply them, what content they access, what they post and share, and what conversations they initiate. TFGBV evolves with the technology, it expands with digitalization, and it morphs in frightening ways. Artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and the metaverse have created new digital spaces for the same forms of gender-based violence that occur offline to also happen online. TFGBV impacts women and girls at disproportionately higher rates who are targeted because of their gender identity. So here we have on the screen uh, various forms of TFGBV or manifestations of TFGBV. Extortion, for example, is about extorting someone online through threats to share sexual information, images or clips of an individual unless they pay the perpetrator. And I think we do know of cases in our own contexts where uh, this has led, extortion has happened and has led the young, young people, especially girls, to take their lives. This trolling, which happens to many women, this is deliberate, inflammatory, insincere, digressive, extraneous, or off-topic direct messaging or posting about an individual in a public forum. Another very common example is non-consexual sharing of intimate messages. This voyeurism, this defamation, this image-based abuse, this talking that happens Again, it happens offline, it also happens online. And stalking is this uh, continued unwanted contact or following of an individual through their online activity. And this can often translate into in-person stalking. So uh, there's dog whistling, there's disinformation. Uh, a, a good example of dog whistling, um, we know former US President uh, Donald Trump, he said of Hillary Clinton, she doesn't have the look, she doesn't have the stamina, and I don't believe she does have the stamina. That's an example of dog whistling. Next slide. So why should we care? We should care because it is a policy objective. As a UN, current UN Women uh, Executive Director, Sima Sami Bahu says, violence against women is not inevitable. In fact, we have more evidence than ever on how to prevent and end it. Next slide. St 
still to do with policy, uh, an objective in the Global Digital Compact, which is uh, at, the, at the moment uh, in the process of, uh, of um, uh, discussion, uh, there's an objective to foster an inclusive, open, safe, and secure digital space that respects, protects, and promotes human rights. The same document talks about digital trust and safety and states we must urgently counter and address all forms of violence, including sexual and gender-based violence, which occurs through or is amplified by the use of technology. And I will say this, commitments and aspirations on digital participation, digital inclusion, on closing the digital divide, they are dead in the water when violation of the rights of women and girls remains a defining feature of tech tools and tech spaces. Uh, I began with a comment about the lack of consensus on TFGBB on the part of governments, whether it exists, whether it's even an issue, whether it is rampant. And to date, this form of infringement of women's rights has not been fully conceptualized, defined, or legislated against. When duty bearers ignore the scope and gravity of TFGBV and or they treat it as a non-issue, it suggests a lack of political will to attend to it. The toolkit uh, contains data that we're launching today, contains data from different sources that shows a wide variation in the same study population. And this is due to variations in definitions, variations in methodologies that are applied to collect this data. And what is needed is not data for the sake of data, but data that is connected to, that drives and informs policy change, program change, awareness creation, and other actions to end women's rights violations in and through technology. And you're going to hear after me a presentation by the Uganda Media Women's Association that demonstrates how the social media monitoring methodology that is um, presented in the kit, how it helps collect uh, good data, the dimensions that it captures, and the evidence-based action plan that the project has inspired. Next slide. So who is at risk? It's young women, it's girls, given the higher level of use of ICTs, it's women in the public eye, like rights activists, journalists, politicians. It's also women from marginalized social sectors, such as those living with disabilities, racialized women, indigenous women, sexual and gender minorities and migrant women, for example. So again, the data on impact is as varied as the methodologies applied to collect it. The toolkit captures the most up-to-date statistics available, impacts to do with political undermining, undermining democracy. We, we see that uh, often in our elections when women stand for political office and all kinds of images and messaging uh, happens online. On, on X space, or on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok, everywhere, are meant to undermine women's participation in democracy. Impact of, uh, on society, uh, withdrawal and silencing of women. Also the psychological harms that it causes women who then, uh, which leads to depression and suicide. We've heard cases and, of, of this happening, as well as the economic impacts where women uh, choose to withdraw uh, from working in the online space because of the abuse that that uh, they that is they are subjected to, and this of course has direct impacts on on their ability to engage professionally uh, in the online space. Next slide. And with this, actually, I will come to I will close here and. Uh, leave for the discussion to uh, John from uh, Uganda Women's Media Watch. Scan this code to access the kit, which is free to download and use. And do contact us at genderjusticeonline at workglobal.org uh, to learn how you can get involved in transforming the tech landscape into one that is free of violence towards women and girls. Thank you, Reverend Nikki. Thank you so very much, Sarah Macharia, Dr. Sarah Macharia. You noted that we are all at risk because when you finish classifying the various people, I noted that there were very few left. Tech facilitated GBV is no respecter of race, class, or nationality. 
It has consequences on our entire society as well as on the economy. And what we seek to do then is to get data that drives program change because we are noticing that our governments are not yet sold on this. With me here in our studio is Sarah Spiker, the WAC Deputy General Secretary, and she has liaised with the World Council of Churches and WAC for this project, ensuring that the project remains on track and provides support in all different areas as needed, as well as serving in the capacity of facilitator for December's event. Sarah. Tell us just a little bit more about this initiative and what it is that you need us to think about as we reflect on and engage with this toolkit. Just before you answer, while you collect your thoughts, I just want to remind those of us gathered on the Zoom that you are very welcome, some of you have already done that, to offer your name, and your region or your country so that we can use this as we are collecting our own data to see what our reach has been. Later, we will be looking through the, the information to see whether you have placed questions in the chat for our Q&A. So Sarah, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Um, and it was, it is great to see on the chat already the range of places where we're at because this is a concern for everybody for every region. And we wanted to provide tools that worked for people in the context that they are, are living in. So the toolkit, I'll just take a few moments to, to walk through the content of the toolkit. And I have a couple of slides um, that will help us to, to see that. So the first statement I will make is that it's in four languages for um, wider use. And we, that would be the WCC languages? The WCC official language, languages. Official sorry. languages. And we're very open to offers to expand that language because we want to make it as widely available as possible. It is based on the workshop outline that we that was referred to in December. And it's also based on our feeling behind the initiative of how we want to transform change. So next slide. Because we see this as a circle of change, of transformation. And of course, the first step that we're trying to do is raise awareness, raise awareness of the reality of tech facilitated gender-based violence through learning, through the content and the, the definitions and the policy frameworks and the impacts of, of uh, tech facilitated gender-based violence. And then we want to work on practical action. So the social media monitoring is, is something that people can do. They can get in and it helps an individual understand the social media more um, and can read social media critically as well as gain the evidence that we need for our work together. And the evidence can be used in more education, in policy, in advocacy, and it all goes in, with your network, local network, but also with a global network. So it can be used on a number of different levels. And all of that goes back um, to awareness. So we see this as a, as a cycle, a circle of changing attitudes and practice that would be very effective. Next slide. So the contents are designed to go through the key aspects of that help people understand what's the issue. So how do you use this toolkit? As a trainer, you can take it, you can look through it, and then you can deliver it to somebody, uh, to another group, your church group or a community group. Um, it starts with the definitions that Sarah Macharya has already gone through to some extent to help us understand really how does it, how does it play out in the world. Um, it looks at today's media landscape. I mean, some of us are very aware, you know, we have a bit more gray in our hair and we're very aware of how the media has changed there from being our nice print or radio to this explosion of social media. Transistor radio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and, and, and what does that mean? Because that's a context for, for this phenomenon of gender-based violence online. 
Um, and then it goes into the coding tools. And you can see, you know, that there's a coding sheet and there are coding instructions that people can follow. But we will also offer more training so people can really be confident in using that, that methodology. I like that you say there will be more training because mm. there are some of us who, the minute we hear use data mm. and coding, we, we we start breaking out in hands. But right. training says, yeah. I don't have to do it anymore. Yeah. And I, I would emphasize that this is built on a, on a methodology that WAC has been using for 25 years called the Global Media Monitoring Project. Yes. And it's moving into the social media sphere. So A, we have a lot of experience. And, but we also have a lot of experience with just local groups who are really able to use this effectively. So we know it works. We know we can, can uh, really bring evidence. And in this toolkit, you also have little exercises. Well, big exercises, little exercises. I mean, you choose, but it helps you to engage and helps groups to engage in, in the issue. So a similar slide, uh, next slide, is, is the one that Sarah Macharya shared, which there's also the, the URL, if people find that uh, easier to access, um, that you can access this toolkit. But next slide. This is also part of a larger initiative. So the toolkit is an action resource for you. And if you implement, if you can help to implement it, it's part of our larger resource that we want to inspire people to join us to overcome tech-facilitated gender-based violence. So there's also a nice purple QR code um, to this larger, that explains this larger initiative that we hope you can join. Thank you so much, Sarah. So if I hear it correctly, the information is in four languages. We are open to translation in others. Just send mm -hmm. us a note. It's aimed at, at transforming our context with data-driven awareness raising for policy change, and it invites practical action. This will then influence our governments and even the globe to have transformation in education and more so in policy. So you and us are change agents. What does that mean in a very practical sense? I don't trust you to tell me because you are the one pushing this and you know, us, us folks are joined in this. Yeah. So, Perhaps we should invite our friends from Uganda, from the Uganda Media Women's Association, who offer practical insights on how this works. I actually do trust Sarah, but you know, we're in this together, so you might not trust what we say. We have folks who can tell us from on the ground what this means. I have with me from the Uganda Media Women's Association to share Nancia Juanita Sanyu and Joseph Higeni. Welcome. What is social media monitoring? What kind of data does this yield? Can you also share from your experience how this played out where you were and then help us to understand how social media monitoring can build critical digital media literacy from a gender perspective. I know it's quite a bit to bite, but as you go, we will be able to unpack that. Thank you so very much. And over to you, Joan. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I want to put off the video. I don't know if that, am I very clear? Very clear so far, yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we use this tool to to respond to a project that was uh, called out by work. And this pro project was promoting responsible coverage of women and girls in digital news on platform X in Uganda. So we are looking at specifically monitoring misogyny on platform X. Uh, but before I go into that, um, I want to talk about Uma a little bit um, uh, in, in just a few minutes, in just a second or two. Um, as, as at Uganda Media Women's Association, we work under uh, uh, a strategic plan. And in this strategic plan, we want to ensure that the media in, in Uganda becomes gender responsive. And we did. We are doing this because we've done a lot of research and we realized that um, gender sensitive, uh, gender sensitive media 
is impacting on the way women is on you know on the way women prosper in terms of politics and everything and you know democratic governance and everything so that's why as umma our role is to ensure that we engender the media in the country so and such a project is very very crucial for us and it's the reason why we had to do it so the background to this study um as part of this uh, project uh, of promoting responsible coverage of women and girls in digital news on platform X, we conducted uh, monitoring of misogyny on platform X. At first, we wanted to do it for just a month or two or three, but realized that in Uganda, the use of platform X is specifically to, to, to not everyone uses it, not so many people use it. It is used by a few people. So when you when you when you do content for just a few months, you can't get the real picture of what misogyny is when it comes to platform X. So we extended the research to twenty from to like three years to see exactly what is happening on platform X in Uganda. So what we are going to share with you is what we we, we found out, and that is a period of about three years. Uh what is um why do we monitor the media? The next slide. Eh? We monitor the media because uh, this can provide concrete evidence-based data on the prevalence and types of misogyny directed at prominent women on platform X. And we believe that this data is crucial for understanding the scope and nature of technology-facilitated gender-based violence on social media in Uganda. We've been, uh, in, we've been doing this on mainstream media and we've been doing less of the digital media but now we are happy that we've, we've also started the digital media and we we are seeing what we see is even telling us that there's needs there's so much work that needs to be done and then when we are doing this research these are some of the highlights that is the next slide the highlights uh, the study highlights significant gender disparities in the posting of misogynistic content and particularly showing that male users are three times more likely to post misogynistic content than female users. And this finding underscores the need for gender sensitive approaches to moderating content on social media platforms. So the other highlight is uh, looking at accountability of media. I want to put off my video because <laughs> some people can come in and then it will be a bit disorganizing. So accountability of media houses. We, in our findings, realize that there are media houses that are allowing the spread of misogyny in the country. That is the next slide. And then there's need for greater accountability and respons responsibility in media reporting and social media presence. So the study results can prompt media houses to reevaluate their social media practices and implement gender sensitive guidelines. Then the other highlight in the findings is um, to provide a foundation for further research into online misogyny in Uganda. Because what we did was just a sample of a few individuals, but we we we, we know that so much is happening in uh, in to women in other spheres because we looked at the journalists, the polit women politicians, and then the civil civil society activists. So if we look at women in general, we wish that uh, this could be um, a good start for the next research. Then the methodology we used when we were using this tool, we looked at uh, posts on X accounts of women politicians. We selected, we, we, we listed all, all the women politicians we could think of, and then we started selecting uh, to see that maybe let's take on these ones, these ones, these ones. So we looked at um, women politicians, women media personnel, and then women who are civil society activists. Then we also looked at uh, posts on X platforms by media houses on about these women. We are looking at X platforms or media houses. I could say like, let me say that maybe a, a, a media house A, they are posts on a particular woman, like those politicians that the journalists and then the, the activists. Then our sample, we looked at 1,640 posts for about 40 women in the public eye. Mm -hmm. And then when when you look at this, when, when I give it a percentage, 
uh, these accounts for individual female. No, account where the person we are looking at was the person writing about this tweet. It, it uh, accounted for 12%. Then the individual female who, who, who wrote about this person, it accounted for 14%. Then the individual male writing about this person accounted for 40%. And then the where the gender was not really clear, that was only 3%. And then for media organization, it was 25%. And then other organizations, that was 7%. And then when 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 you look at the, that is the next post, look at the next post, misogynic posts by identical poster. When when you look at all, all what we monitored, all what we looked at using that tool, and these are the posts that were misogynistic, the person, on, on the person's own account, we had only 1% post that was misogynistic. Then the individual female, so the female person writing on the other females we've talked about, the percentage was 7%. And then the individual male, and now that is very interesting, the percentage was 64%. The female is 7%. The female herself writing about herself is just 1%. And then the male, writing misogynic, misogynistic post about another about a female is 64%. And then where the gender was not clear, that was 2%. And a media organization writing a misogynistic post about a female was at 24%. And then the other groups of organizations, that was only 2%. So we realized that uh, the most misogynic, misogynistic posts were posted by male male people so when you look at the next slide that is slide 10 uh, it will show you the distribution of these posts misogynistic posts in terms of uh, the media house when you go to the media house in particular in uganda we have various media house we have about 300 radio stations uh, we have about um, 60 tv stations we have uh, and so many other uh, print whatever. But when, when, when you look at um, these ones which we sampled, the ones that had X, uh, that had active X platforms, Galaxy FM was very, very prominent in posting misogynistic posts. And Galaxy FM in Uganda is a radio which has, which has a wide range of listenership, a wide range of young listeners. So, but when you look at the content they post and what the young people are following, it is really it needs some, I don't know what it needs, but it is really absurd. And then the misogynistic posts we looked at were classified into different forms. For example, those that were stereotypical, objectification, and then body shaming, that was the biggest percentage at 53%. Then those that uh, looked at, th that were discrediting women, they were at 19%. Those that uh, were sexual, like, in terms of sexual harassment, violence, and then threats of violence, that was at 12%. Then those ones that showed dominance over women at 9%, and then derailing women at 7%. Then uh, on slide number 12, we look at the types of misogyny directed at women in terms of percentages. Um, the, the, the stereotypes was, of course, the highest, like I've said earlier. Then when we go to the the types of people that received the highest misogyny, we see that uh, the media professionals received the highest misogyny when it comes to to objectifying, body shaming, and then stereotype posts that are stereotypical in nature. So when the media professionals were were so much stereotyped, when the misogyny was so much a sort of a stereotype, when this particular person was posting on this particular women. And then we see even women politicians getting a lot of misogynistic posts in terms of discrediting them and realize that uh, maybe some, it is, for us, we think that sometimes it is done deliberately, maybe to put women away from politics, we don't know. But some, when you look at these tweets critically, you might have a feeling that someone is doing it deliberately to ensure that women don't participate in some of the things. So when you go to slide number 14, you will, you will have um, a feel of the example of some of those misogynistic tweets. For example, there's a lady, she's a, a journalist, she's called Evelyn Mike. She writes, 
And then she says, how do you invite someone to your house, then cook for them beans? It would be better to kindly ask them to come after eating or turn up with their own food and why beans, really? Then this person is called Paul, replies to this tweet and says, girls who offer their bodies for a Rolex at campus are now talking. So you realize that now the person is talking about something different, and now this one is putting her down that seems this lady at campus offered her body to someone for a Rolex. And you know Rolex is, a, is some chapat and egg, which is very cheap in Uganda, like the cheapest meal in Uganda. So it's like she offered her body to a Rolex, to, to get a Rolex at campus, and now she's busy talking here. And it, she's a journalist, a credible journalist. Then we also see tweets of body shaming. An example, uh, we see a journalist, she's called Remy Bahati, that is slide 15. She says, this one wrote, writes, is called Muhumza Wilson. He writes to, he writes a tweet and says, dear world, people on, dear world, people on behalf of Ugandans, we strongly disassociate, disassociate with Remy Bahati in Uganda. We don't in Uganda, we don't own people who are having different skin colors. Maybe South Sudan can claim her. And then they put a picture of her where she really looks dark, and then another picture where she really looks light skin. Then the same uh, on the on the uh, another one posts on the very same person. She's a journalist, Remy Bahati. Then this one is called Mr. Jonah and says, even after spending a lot of money on bleaching. Bahati Remy remains to look ugly and no man is interested in her. You see? And then they put pictures of her in 2016 and then vis-a-vis -vis pictures of 2023. So it's like she has to be, she has to remain where she was. She, can, she can't look good or what. She has to remain the way she looked in 2016 and the way she looks in 2023. Then we also see uh, tweets where women are belittled. That is slide number 16. Where women are belittled. For example, and this one is done by the media house called Galaxy FM. It says, the man who loves Suku most in Uganda, Andrew Kabura, wedded lover with Suku exactly two years ago. So they have, they have put two pictures of a journalist who wedded a fellow journalist, and this fellow journalist is a female, and the other guy is, 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 is a male. So they are saying they are all journalists. So they are dragging her that saying that uh, the, this woman, this woman is she's she, she she's just you know watery or what everything whatever they are saying she's watery she cannot be. It's not about her journalism skill. It's not about her being able to marry her, but it's like she married her. He married her because she's watery, and you know we see such a tweet by a media house, and then we also see tweets of justifying abuse of women on slide number seventeen whereby this woman, a politician, says that uh, we have been released from police custody following our arrest today morning for protesting over police brutality. Then she says, my body hurts, but my spirit is unbroken. My heart is full. My resolve is stronger than ever. And the fire inside me burns hotter than ever. Then the, the tweet, the reply on that tweet says, it seems most politicians want to first break the law have all have attractions with the police and then attract sympathy. So we see that this is a member of parliament, but this someone has the guts to reply to her like that in uh in such a manner. Then we also see tweets of sexualizing sex, sexualization of women, and this one also was done by Galaxy FM on slide number 18, where we see someone writes that Galaxy FM writes that NTV finds dance solo king dance dance solo king Andrew Kabura Kabura's re replacement in Lakin Baba's is Bin Pekka Patrick Kanyomos. So the 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 news was about NTV finding a replacement of Kabura who is Kanyomozi. But the the media house is writing that they have they have replaced her with Kanyomozi who is also a, a someone dating Lucky Mbabas. But Lucky Mbabas, she's a journalist, she's a mother, she's married, and you know, someone is writing this on Twitter, and it's a media house. Then when we go to slide number 19, our experiences when we are using this tool, uh, some of the people we worked with, we see that um, 
Peace at home says that as a female journalist, I've often encountered harassment and discrimination online, but this exercise has provided me with a deeper understanding of what happens online and that most women online face some kind of violence. The whole coding process is a clear sign that there is need for UMA to embark on crucial mission to ensure women feel safe both in physical and on Twitter was an eye-opening and empowering experience for me as a participant. The training opened my eyes to grave things that happen to women in the online space. That violence to women does not happen in the physical space, but also extends to the online spaces. As a gender officer, the coding experience has given me determination to continue confronting violence against women while giving a keen interest to violence that happens on the online spaces. Then we also have Doreen Sampa, who was part of the team coding. As we immersed ourselves in the coding process, we found I found myself gaining a deeper understanding of the subtle ways in which misogyny manifests on Twitter, from derogatory language to targeted attacks on women's credibility and competence. We uncovered a disturbing pattern of behavior that often goes unchecked. And then Brenda Namata was part of the team. She also says that looking ahead, I am committed to applying what I have learned to my work as a journalist, ampl amplifying the voices of women and shedding light on the deception nature of online harassment. Together, we have the power to effect change and create a more inclusive digital landscape for women everywhere. Then Paul Kavali says that I have been coding traditional media, but the process of coding misogyny on, on especially Twitter highlights clear lang clearly language and behavior that can perpetuate harmful stereotypes and undermine women's voices. Understanding the use of Twitter advanced search gave real example of how many people can choose to be violent towards others in the online space. And then as we are doing this uh, coding and then everything, we had we had some shocks and surprises as a team, or some of the some of us, some of the people who are part of the team shared some of their shocks. For example, one said that shocking to see how often women are targeted simply for being women with their work or ideas ignored in favor of personal attacks. That is on slide 23. Then also uh, the other one shared that surprising to see that the lack of consequences for abusers. Galaxy FMS action, for example, might highlight how some media outlets can get away with blunt and negativity. Then the other said unexpected sources of abuse, while some negative comments might be from anonymous trolls, it could be surprising to see established media outlets like Galaxy FM engaging in such behaviors. Of course, there were some challenges um, when we are monitoring, of course, when we are using that tool. The constant exposure to negativity could be emotional training because this tool clearly shows you um, how the media is, uh, is um, you know, belittling women in whatever ways and whatever, how the media has given freedom to anyone to do whatever they want online. So we see that uh, when you're doing such, you get a bit emotional drain. And then uh, sometimes identifying which category of misogyny was this, you know, putting them in clear categories was also a challenge there. Then also the the sheer volume of online content made it difficult to get truly a comprehensive picture of the situation. And then this is the ED, Margaret St. she has something to say. She said, I'm, I'm not that enthusiastic about Platform X, but as I was reviewing the study report, I felt what? These are the kind of narratives meted out by supposedly educated people with the power and authority in Uganda platform X is considered for the well to do and policy makers. If such blunt and negativity is altered by such people, who then is going to change the narrative? Our responsibility as media managers is squarely part of the equation. If not addressed today, many women in different professionals shall quit. Women's voices will no longer feature in policy making, allowing further male domination and associated suffering. And then so there's some call for action, the call for government, call for for government to guide online platforms, then call for all women, especially the journalists, uh, to be empowered and, and to report these online negative instances. Then they, we want also to call on media houses to have uh, avenues for reporting gendered violences in their media houses. Then the civil society to advocate for legal and policy frameworks that criminalize this misogyny criminalize anything that that is uh perpetuating violence to women especially in the media whether online or offline then media rights uh 
and gender equality focus CSOs to engage media houses and other relevant stakeholders on the dangers of misogyny in media, in media, including raising awareness about cyber violence and its impact on women. Then also to donors to support initiatives that promote digital literacy and online safety skills for women and girls. Then in our, in our research, we wanted to acknowledge work for the financial contribution and then for providing that tool, which we used to unearth all this. Then we also want to acknowledge Otopa Mili fans of the World, 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 World Asian Evangelical Church, Union of Methodology, Methodist and World Asian Churches for the financial support. Then also we want to thank very much Joseph Higeni, our lead researcher, who guided us in all this, and then the support team at UMA and then the leadership of UMA. And that is all. Wow. Thank you so very much, Jonita. Gender disparities, accountability, and this provides us with a baseline for research. The main targets you were looking at on Platform X are politicians and media personalities. And you noted that the discrediting comes often from media houses, but more so from individual males. To you who are joining us, we wanna thank you for staying the course and for some of you who have been inviting others because we see you coming on with multiple personalities suggesting that you said, you know, don't even wait to register, just use my code and come on and that's fine. But the question for you from me is this, can you think of persons in your own context who have been subject to TFGDV? More critically, who stands up for them? How have we individually and collectively responded to this? There is need for us to interrupt the status quo. There is a call for us as people of faith to be part of this monitoring and transforming process. We must call for consequences directed at perpetrators of TFGBV because as we were told in the closing parts of this presentation, if this is not addressed today, many women in different professions shall quit, further perpetuating patriarchal and misogynistic attitudes. Sarah Spiker, Sarah Macharia, how can people get involved? What are the WCC and WAC plans going forward? What do we want people to do with this, in addition to the call to action that Jonita offered us? Sarah and Sarah, let's hear from you. Well, I think what we saw with this fantastic case study with uh, the Uganda Media Women's Association is how transformative just digging farther into the social media can be to each individual, and then how the evidence can be used quite locally or quite nationally. So that's mm -hmm. the first step. So I think the first step actually is download the toolkit, look through it, um, get a group. Maybe you are part of an organization or um, a media agency or you know the church or a group of women. Get several people together to say, yes, we'd like to do this. You know, it doesn't, you don't have to make sure you're signing up for several years, but you want to learn more. And then we're going to, as WAG, hold more of a training. So I want people to save the date of October 2nd. October um, 2. October 2, just coming, coming up in a couple of weeks. And we will organize an online training to help you um, do the coding uh, more confidently. Amen. And so, on, and just on that, you can see how it's going to you know, raise awareness. And then we want to collect the data. And that's the important piece because mm -hmm. it is important that we understand and it impacts us. But if the data is not collected and shared and utilized, then some of the transformation remains okay. stagnated. Yes. And I think Sarah Macharia could talk a little bit more about how the data could be used both locally and by us. Yes, and even before I, I go there, 
I'd also like to add that we are crowdsourcing information on, on legislation and policies in our countries that uh, is specifically about or related to online gender-based violence. Um, in the kit and, and in our resources, you will see a place where you can enter, enter that information on, a, on an online platform. And this is also an exercise in building awareness about uh, what uh, legal frameworks exist in our jurisdictions that not many people use to report and follow up on such abuse. How can we use the data? Media monitoring data is invaluable evidence for advocacy, for awareness, especially for policy advocacy. We need to hold uh, platforms to account. Uh, we do know that platforms have uh, content moderation protocols, but uh, these do not necessarily always work. So uh, this data can help us uh, provide the evidence to get you know, platform moderators or platforms to act. Uh, the data also helps us in, in building our own knowledge uh, and uh, Applying this, uh, I, I did mention in the presentation that um, because of the variations of methodologies, it's it's very it's almost impossible to compare from one jurisdiction from one country to the other. You know, across across years. Uh, therefore, if we do all apply this uh, social media monitoring methodology, you know, very much uh, in the way that Umar uh, John's presentation has shown we would be able to collect some uniform data that can be compared across countries. And we would be able to begin building this data so that all these naysayers uh, about TFGBV who, who feel that, you know, it's not important, it's just an issue, it's, it's a non-issue that, we, you know, we can, we can start uh, holding duty bearers to account. Thank you so very much, Sarah Macharia. We will be sharing a slide in a minute with the link for this toolkit and also contact details. But this 16 days of activism, November 25 to December 10, this would be a perfect time for you to join us with participating in social media monitoring. We often see and use social media in many ways and spaces. And during the 16 days, activity increases in both directions. Why not join us? as part of our 16 days activities to say, I want to monitor the media in my context. Get the toolkit, learn more about it and be a part of this very critical life and social transformation movement in this world. We do it today, not just for a better tomorrow, but to change our context today. Thank you so very much for joining us. It's not time to leave us yet. It's actually your time. Is there any burning question, any burning issue that you wish to have us discuss before we leave you in a few minutes? And there is a hand. Yes, Funmi Falobi. Funmi? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. And I must commend WAC and WCC for this, um, for the two kids. And I also want to commend the work um, brought for the, the brought for the world for the opportunity given to Nigeria journalists for Christ in undergoing the counter counter narrative on misogyny and online gender based in Nigeria. And from what we have had, well, from the Uganda, Uganda Media Women Association is going to help us really in the project that is ongoing in Nigeria. Well done, Bob. Thank you so very much, Funwe. And thank you, WAC, Bread for the World, and all the others who have contributed and collaborated with WCC and WAC to make all this possible. Now, what I hear, and maybe you have heard, is that tech-facilitated GBV affects all of us. 
But the best way for us to do the monitoring is to start with persons who have made it in the news by tracking what has been said or retweeted in social media spaces, particularly on platform X. I am sure that we could find other information in other spaces, but it's easier for us to do the coding with something like Platform X, formerly known as Twitter. We will find that in our context, we can look at who is making the statement, who is the statement directed at? Because while we hear that it was directed at women, there might even be scope for us to say, was it directed at women in general, or was it directed at a particular person? And we know that the comments went from almost benign comments to extremely offensive. offensive. That's the word, offensive. Having coded, having analyzed, and it doesn't mean we're not going to take on this fancy analysis, but having just looked at the data that we've collected, we need to think, what can I do? Step one, share the information with WAC. The same place where you would have gotten the information for the coding tools and the toolkit, you send it back to us so that we can use it as part of our work with the wider spaces. But B, each of us in our sphere of influence knows someone. And if we don't know the someone who can make decisions and changes, we know someone who knows someone who knows someone. And the last I checked, almost all of us have the right to vote or know someone who has the right to vote. What if we were to insist that changes be made? Now, I don't know about you, but in my context, we often accuse the media of being un uncaring. Let's take the other side of it and be part of the media monitoring. So join us, be a part, spread the word, and let us together work for an end of sexual and gender-based violence, and in this context, tech facilitating GBV. I am again, Reverend Nikki Ashwood of the World Council of Churches, and this is Sarah Spiker from the World Association for Christian Communication. And we thank you for joining us. God bless you. <laughs>